about things that really affect you. Remember when we talk about ecology, the relationship between organisms and the environment, we're really talking about ourselves. I mean, we're part of an environment. And especially when we look at it from the evolutionary biology point of view, you'll see how closely these, uh, these topics are related to our, to our daily lives. And a lot of what we talk about is going to be focusing on, on that. Like, for example, I use an awful lot of examples with diseases, with human diseases, mainly because that's really ecology. It's the organisms and the environment. It's interactions among organisms. And some of you probably have heard of, like malaria I'll talk about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to a different part of the world. I'm going to take you to Africa. And I'm going to talk about a disease program that's been the most successful public health program of the, certainly the latter part of the 20th century, maybe the whole 20th century. That is the control of a disease called river blindness. And I spent 15 years of my life working uh, on this. Uh, and it's really, to me, a wonderful example of what we're going to talk about in general biology in terms of the interaction of humans and other organisms. Now, this scene that you see here of a young child leading a blind adult, always with a stick, and sometimes I remember working in Africa, you would see maybe uh, literally trains of 15 people being led by, uh, by one child. This adult is blind. It's blind from a disease called river blindness, or onchocerciasis. Now, the uh, onchocerciasis is one of the most dreaded diseases in Africa. Not that it kills you, but what happens is at a certain stage in your life, you just end up being blind. And 30 to 40 percent of people that are living in villages along rivers, which is why they call it river blindness, end up not being able to see. Sometimes it happens very to people that are very old, such as this uh, this man here. Uh, other times it happens to people that are that are your age, and it's a buildup of this parasite that causes you to go blind. Now the parasite is a roundworm, and uh, round worms, or sometimes you'll call them filarial worms, because they look like threads. And uh, phil is the root of the Latin root for, for thread. This particular round worm is transmitted by biting females of a black fly, which is a very painful biter, which is why the name damnosum, you know, damnosum. Okay, they're nuisances. Uh, it's very, very painful. The bites take a couple of uh, uh, weeks to heal. And people that live in these villages along these rivers used to get about 10,000 bites a year. So this was a huge parasite load that they had, and also a very, very painful, uh, painful load. Now, in parasitic diseases, you really have two choices of how you can deal with, the, uh, with controlling the disease. One is you control the vector of the disease. In this case, it's the biting insect that's caused the, called the black fly, or you control the parasite. Now, we're going to talk really about both ways of doing this and uh, look at this in a little more detail. Uh, if we look at, first of all, the life cycle in humans, we see the, the larva of this parasite, the larva of this worm, and it's called a microfilaria, micro meaning small, fill filaria, meaning this thread-shaped worm, uh, enters the skin through a bite. And it's the bite of an insect that's infected with the uh, with the disease. The insect doesn't suffer any ill effects from the disease. It simply transmits the disease. So what happens is the adults grow in the human body uh, and they reproduce in the subcutaneous tissue. What you tend to see in humans that have it is that they have lumps located along uh, their pelvis. In, interestingly, in South America, where it was brought in with slaves to South America, the lumps tend to appear on the skull, on the head. So very, very interesting. So then what happens is after reproduction, we have these larval worms forming. And the larval worms spread throughout the body. But what's really interesting is they are down in the tissue feeding during the, during the night. They're actually feeding on the human skin. This is how they grow. But during the day, they migrate up to the surface. During the day, they migrate up to the surface. Now. This is fascinating because you know what happens? The black flies only bite during the day. So by migrating up, they enable themselves to get better picked up by a blood-sucking female 
that is biting an infected person. So an example of microevolution, okay, directional selection. Okay, they have evolved the ability to have this interesting behavior where they migrate to the surface and they increase their chances of getting, picking up, uh, uh, being picked up by the biting black fly. So the black fly bites an infected human and that's how it starts. Now, in the human, or in the black fly, it's a very, very interesting life cycle too. The black fly bites that infected human and she picks up the microfilaria that have migrated to the skin. And then the, the, these, these worms, larval worms, actually penetrate through the gut of the biting fly. They move through the butt of the guiding fly, they migrate through the muscles, they enter the head and the beak, and they actually lodge in the salivary glands. That's how they get transmitted. So this is an incredible evolutionary response. I mean, normally, anything that gets picked up in the gut gets digested and just gets passed out. They've evolved the ability to migrate through the gut, to migrate to the muscles, to migrate to the head, and then actually get transmitted. So the Fly bites a human, microfilaria enter, and the cycle gets continued. Now, here's a little of what, what it looks like. Here is the biting female picking up these microfilaria that have uh, migrated to the surface. Here is uh, lar or adult worms. Uh, these are the worms that would be concentrated around the pelvis or, or in the nodules on the head. Each of these worms is about 15 inches long. They're quite large. These are the full-grown adults. And there's a series of stages that happen in, uh, in river blindness, one of which is that you have this tremendous itching that occurs, and then gradually scarring. So in a society where you know, scarring is not considered very, very beautiful, this is a, a kind of dooming someone to, uh, to a life alone. And then eventually what happens is the disease spreads through the body. Remember, your immune system or that person's immune system is constantly working on the disease. So you end up getting a lot of scar tissue forming as the immune system tries to kill the larval worms. The scar tissue causes this opaqueness of the eye and the person goes blind. The Africans have a wonderful name for this. They call it uh, lion stare because of this look of the person who's blinded by river, uh, river blindness. Have you ever looked at a zoo? the lions always seem to have this kind of blue-eyed stare off into, the, off into the distance. So the problem with river blindness is that people have left valleys, that river valleys, where the most fertile agricultural land is. So that you have this wholesale abandonment of the best place to grow, grow crops. And the areas that we're going to talk about today are the, literally the poorest areas in the world. This is West Africa and East and Central Africa, where the average household income may be about $250. So leaving this very, very fertile area to go to uh, areas that are not so good, but you get away from river blindness, ends up being a tremendous, tremendous economic uh, 